It is April the 10th, 2021, and this is The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. Hello and welcome back everyone. I'm Chris. There's Imar, Adrian, and Jeremiah. Hello, Jeremiah. You can you can scuttle up a bit in your bubble. <laughs> ah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> or maybe not. How's everyone doing today? Still in my bubble. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, not too bad. Not too yeah, bad. That's good. Ah, it is time to talk photography again on the future photography. Um, and today we want to talk about rights. Rights, who owns them? How does this whole thing work? And just especially interesting because we have uh, different parts of the planet here on the show. So uh, things mm -hmm. are different in the UK, in the US, in Ireland probably. And uh, here in Germany, they are very different. So, um, so, so different, in fact, that I have to correct you already, Chris. Apologies. Um, in in the the in the UK, um, there is a distinction between English law and Scottish law, mm -hmm. um, and other laws as well. So, okay, you know, it's, it's, uh, so it's it's a tricky one. It's a tricky hold that one. thought. Hold that <laughs> thought, because before that, I just wanted to bring one thing up, and we thought we we we. Uh, I was debating if we made this, if we should make this into a, its own show, but then this is just a little side note, I guess, but an interesting one at that, um, which does have to do with the future of photography, maybe street photography or other photography. Um, it's called deep privacy. Has any one of you heard of deep privacy? Other Not than really. the things I put in the show notes. Um, so um, mm -hmm. there is software to create uh, faces. We've we've all seen that um, mm. this this here here it is this is the one this person, um, really this person does not exist dot com and yeah. you refresh it yeah. and you get people who do not exist mm -hmm. and uh, an AI yeah, has made it. them so that is uh, something that is already in pretty wide use and then there is the technique called face swapping which probably a lot of people have played with. You can put an app on your phone and you can just swap a face with a friend. Um, so someone has put that together to automatically swap out the faces in photos with artificial faces. Just imagine the implications of that. So um, I was curious, and it's still, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a tool that ha it has colorful buttons and things. It's still a command line thing. It's still very nerdy, but it works and it, I think it's just a matter of time for it to show up in some software packages, Photoshop and stuff. I, I could do with an app for that, actually, that just takes a photo of me from 20 years ago and replaces my current <laughs> face with it. <laughs> or maybe my hair, actually, That'd my hair good, from 10 it? years ago now, and my face from 20 years ago. I'd be perfectly happy. <laughs> now, the results are pretty amazing because I've, I've done a few experiments here. I just uh, fed it some of my own photos and the one on the top is always the original and the one on the bottom is the one that was automatically replaced and it keeps the light it keeps the orientation it keeps the color it keeps the skin color it 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 mm. does pretty interesting things that's probably too small to see something let me go to the next one sometimes it looks a little bit artificial but <laughs> it does a really good <laughs> job i mean here look at this one wow just imagine you, you this is going to be really scary for a very you know, famous actors, musicians, and whatnot, mm. who will get their faces put on, sort of like like the well, that's that's know, the like, deep fakes that have already happened and that are already uh, in mm. circulation. But no, this true. this I this think is, is the opposite. Though. This one is this one is privacy focused because one of the applications could be um, that you're in a in a jurisdiction where and that kind of ties in with the right situation, personality rights, where where you take street photos. And uh, here in Europe, taking street photos is is kind of difficult and even not really legal right now. Mm. Um, so being really? able to swap wow. out all the faces, that uh, am I, so sometimes the results are a bit hilarious, but it even <laughs> detects a black and white photo. Um, it uh, Let me see. I threw a bunch of politician group shots in there and it, it found every <laughs> single one. And it took Trump wow. out and replaced him by someone. So that must be a good thing, right? <laughs> so um, this is, I think, quite wow, amazing. It's, it's yeah. not quite there in terms of quality, 
but wait six months. Yeah, it's it's just a matter of time. This is a machine learning based. This is an AI. This uh, the development is going so fast mm -hmm. right now that I think just uh, one or two more iterations down the road, and this will be um, indistinguishable. So can can you help close the loop for me, Chris? Because I'm not sure I'm seeing how this gives us privacy. Well, let's say you are at a place where you're, where you you're not supposed to publish pictures from because people could be on there. Mm -hmm. This way, you can yeah. publish pictures also, because the people's faces won't of, be there. Yeah, think of like things around school groups or just classes that involve kids that you want to make publicity around and you can't use the child's image without the like there's loads of that's a minefield of um you know so we're talking imagine, about commercial use sharing. Imagine, commercial use of photography imagine then. google street well, View. even just for right now they blur all the yeah, faces right I, yeah you just replace them with whatever yeah. I, I imagine it'd be brilliant for a street photographer. You know. How about for politicians caught in compromising situations photographically <laughs> who then create uh, an image fake with the faces. fake faces and say, my face was that replaced on this picture. <laughs> it's not me. Yeah. And accuse the deep fake. <laughs> so, uh, Ema, tell uh, me The about real picture is uh, being a deep fake. Yeah. Ema, tell me about yeah. the street photography thing. Because for me, uh, uh, you know, street photography, if, if it's a if it's about people. I mean, I, I kind of distinguish in my own work, well, but, well I kind of distinguish in my own work between yeah. street photography, your sort of landscape, urban landscape stuff versus mm, you know, street mm, photography, mm, which is about mm. people. And is it not the case yeah. that when it's people, it's it's about the looks on their faces? It is, you see, but I, I would be, I wouldn't take pictures with, like, I, I've seen, I know there's people that I even follow that um, would do that, but and they're just like random characters on the street. But it's still um, like that person never knows you you took that picture, maybe. And it is an invasion of their privacy, even if they don't know it. You or know? imagine you so take a street just, shot with like a whole I bunch of people in the background, you know, that, that, that are not yeah, important. Yeah, like the if there was a ton important. of people... Yeah, in a, in that sort of group situation there, the, like you did with the politicians, I could see how it'd be useful for sort of, you know, um, just uh, blurring out or, you know, replace those faces that are far away and they don't need to be like super detailed or whatever. Right. But um, yeah, I, I don't know the ramifications of, of photographing people on the street like that at all. I, 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 I think it's not something I feel what what are the What with. are the legal issues with... Uh, taking pictures on the street and then putting those pictures in a gallery or a book without a model release. Well, yeah, that, I, I, that's that, I'd that'd be nervous be, about all of that. Know. I wouldn't go near it. I don't, you know? I don't like, shoot I just, like that, so I don't. I don't really. Well, know it's it's a mind so. it's a minefield, especially in, in different jurisdictions. I mean, in Europe. Um, I think European, I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that, but European law, I think, doesn't even allow you to take a picture of someone without their consent. So is that right now? Taking I didn't a know candid that. street shot mm -hmm. in Europe is, uh, it's not something Provoking? that you would, that, uh, I think it is, yes. I think, I think it is. I mean, it always depends on, uh, I think different countries have different, um, in different European countries have different levels of how to enforce that or if they enforce that at all. Um, but in general, in Europe, uh, there is no legal way to take a picture of someone without their consent. Wow. How about in 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 a situation with a photojournalist who is covering, say, a fire journalism? Street, different thing. We're talking journalism, and uh, uh, jur journalism is is its own protected area. But then, the the um, street the street photography for photography's sake, for art's sake. Um, that is, it's not as easy now as it used to but, be. But that would, presumably oh, that's a commercial mm -hmm. use of, is it? Because, you know, if you're a tourist and you go and take a photo and mm -hmm. there are people in the photo, that's not illegal, is it? Well, hmm. as, as I said, I'm not, <laughs> I, I do, I, I'm, I do not really fully understand it to the last bit, mm. but the general gist is, if you are an artist, if you take photos, uh, if you're a photographer and you do street photography in a, in a candid fashion, then that could be problematic. Of course, if you put this on, if you keep mm. this for yourself in your own slideshows, then I don't think there will be ever an issue. But uh, is, I think yeah. the moment yeah. you publish something like that, you 
could be in deep water pre pretty quickly. I wonder, is that whole journalism um, being its own thing? Is that line a bit blurred now with all the kind of mobile devices and like everyone's a journalist now with your phone in your pocket? That's a good could question. Could you argue? I don't think it's been, argue been to court yet, way. but uh, we'll see. Mm. It will be, I'm sure. Yeah. Let's test it. <laughs> so I, I think that, is, that nicely ties in with the main topic. I mean, who owns your pictures? Who owns your... Uh, who owns your work? And I think we'll have to look at this from, yeah, th through the lens of different um, countries, different parts of this planet, because it is really different everywhere. So, uh, Adrian, you said something about the UK versus Scotland versus who knows uh, what. I, I did, I, I did, and I've just looked back at my uh, UK government website, which I've been uh, linking in the show notes, which I'm using as my primary source for for the show today. Um, and actually, it refers to uh, a UK view of copyright law. I, I know that it's not all laws that different uh, the different between the the UK countries. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, I guess this may be one area where there is a uh, a UK view. Um, but the, the, the interesting thing here, actually, is the, the reason I've chosen this page is that this is a page that uh, is uh, a government website, for one thing. So it's an, an official view. Um, and uh, it is it is a page that's been written to be helpful and to prov and it provides examples uh, of usage. So it not just talks about you know who owns copyright and in, in images and what some of the, the the rights and the constraints are. It also gives examples about well, I want to use. Uh, I want to post a photo on the internet that has X in it or, or stuff like that. And uh, for me, that was a, a really good thing because yeah, I, I've listened on and off ever since I became interested in photography, uh, uh, you know, to all sorts of podcasts about, yeah, which, which talk about the law around this area. None, none of them actually ever quote sources that are helpful. It's all people who have you know, had to get like copyright lawyers involved to give a, uh, a, 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 uh, a, a true view or a true, I say a true view a, a, a good interpretation a robust interpretation of the law so I was very pleased to see that that you know, my my government at least has a, a very helpful page of how to use this stuff um, but it's uh, it's it's an interesting thing I mean some of it is really obvious it's like if you click the shutter button the copyright is yours unless you've been somebody else has paid you to take the, the photograph it has mm. a specific uh, what I would call a Crudson clause um, which is that uh, if you are the creator um, yeah, in the sense that you have composed it, you've you know you've done the the art direction, you've you've built the set and set the lighting, but somebody else presses the button, um, then actually it's the creator that owns the copyright, not the button pusher. So that's interesting. I, we wouldn't have had the monkey selfie issue in this country, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then it goes on to list a, a whole bunch of, of of use case stuff, but it talks just to give you some of the headings are digitized copies of older images protected by copyright is permission always required to copy or use an image. Uh, what if I don't know who the copyright owner is? What if there's no copyright symbol? Uh, yeah, the, the, it, there's quite a lot of stuff in this web page, actually. It's That's a good really reason why there are copyright lawyers, lawyers in this world, because mm. it is not simple, right? <laughs> it is not simple. No, it's yeah. definitely it's not also, simple here. It is not a settled law anywhere. Yes. Uh, copyright is an amorphous, changing, um, uh, active, and very alive situation. Especially in a time where memes happen online, yeah. and the meme and a mashup of different things, um, where you have a photo that all of a sudden circulates and becomes uh, viral with some added text on it and so on, which is, yeah, which is... It, it really challenges the current notion. You're making funny sounds over there, Jeremiah. No, that's not me. <laughs> it was a motorbike, that wasn't sorry. Me. That was no. hers. That was hers. Oh, that was in wasn't Ireland. Me. I, it, it wasn't was my motorbike. stomach either. Mm. Or worse. <laughs> um, F, a big I have Irish a question. Motorbike. If you take a photograph of a public sculpture or a wall of graffiti done by an artist or a Banksy mm. and then publish it. Who owns the copyright then? Uh, give me a minute. I'll look it that's, up. <laughs> that, yeah. You won't get a, dis, a, a definitive answer yeah. anywhere. Uh, yeah. it, it, it's a very, very complicated uh, realm, uh, a realm that I've had to uh, drill down on for my own work. 
I mean, as a as a as a director, I think you must you must be quite well versed in at least yeah. the intricacies on a on a on a U.S. scale, right? Well, I've spoken to some mm. of the really uh, you know heavyweight copyright lawyers. So mm. I actually was. Um, I won't go into it, but but uh, more more on the governmental level with music copyright infringement. What during the Napster case, I was um, with a friend. We we kind of testified uh, in front of Congress, gave our two cents about what that is. Um, it wasn't me that testified, but I was. We had a company, and we were kind of focused in that direction. Um, but you know the 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 realm of who owns what. Uh, really has a lot to do with where it ends up, I think, and how how the image itself either is uh, invasive of someone else's privacy, their own copyright, um, and if it is a commercial practice that it deprives them of the ability to exploit it over a period of limited time. That's the other thing. Copyright is not granted, especially in this country, forever. Uh, it's been extended because of corporate pressures, specifically Disney. Um, hmm. But but when uh, the original copyright law, uh, early in, in American uh, politics and, and, and law, came uh, because they, you know, the, the founders wanted to encourage um, innovative work in all, you know, in all realms, not just publishing, which is the focus mm -hmm. of the time, but, but in all work, so that the creators, the innovators, were able to capitalize and make profits and reinvest and encourage that for profit. But after that reached a certain what was indicated as a fair uh, realm in terms of time. I think it was originally 35 years. Uh, now it's, I think, 75 years. Uh, that it reverts to uh, the people, and and mm. which I think is a very you know a very smart way of of doing it. And we see the battles with the drug companies keeping a you know uh, a patent, which is you know a, a kind of an offshoot mm. of, of copyright. Um, and doing protective work, or people like uh, Martin, what's his name, who bought the rights to this EpiPen, which was selling for 10 or 12 bucks, or I don't know, I'm just making that up, but all of a sudden charged 750 bucks because he bought the patent. And, you know, the, those kinds, of, he's in jail now, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, I think. Oh, the, Scra the, Scraley, you mean that guy? Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right, yeah. Um, who owns your work in in the world of NFTs is also very interesting. Not that anyone's <laughs> interested, but if you buy an image <laughs> as an NFT, you don't actually own the copyright to that work. True. You have bought a token that leads you to have the ownership of your ability to view it. Uh, but oh, not to exploit it commercially <laughs> unless otherwise okay, indicated by a smart okay. contract. Let's, let's, can we, leave, can let's, let's very <laughs> silently step aside and back from the crypto <laughs> thing again. Uh, <clears throat> Just thought I would mm -hmm. mention it. Here's an interesting tidbit. Uh, the term copyright doesn't mean anything in Germany. Does not exist. No? You will see oh. it on, on works of art, yeah. on pictures and so on. A lot of Germans put it on because... You see it everywhere, mm. but it doesn't have any legal meaning whatsoever. There is no copyright in Germany. Is everything Creative Commons? What? No, <laughs> no. We have, <laughs> we have. Um, well, the German term is Urheberrecht, which um, would probably translate to something like cr a creator's right or author's right. Okay. And mm -hmm. the moment you create a work, you, and the moment you take a photo, you have that right. Yeah. It's non-transferable. Mm. You cannot give it to someone else it is yours to keep and uh, it stays with you and uh, it was originally um, uh, thought out to protect the, the 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 creators the musicians the authors the creatives um, while the the u.s-based copyright 
has much more of an economic focus and uh, decisions totally, yeah. and, and usage rights um, this are pretty much decided by the copyright owner, the one who bought the copyright or uh, who, who got the copyright. But um, is, is the German uh, law or lack of um, similar to the uh, droit moral? Yeah, I think in, that's in that's the or, I think that might even be the origin of it. So so of course of course as a as an author I can license something to someone I can give someone the license to use it um, specified by where and how much and how long and and so on. Um, but in the end, that uh, that originators right. Um, has a few things that you cannot get rid of or it's, that it's non fungible. Give to someone else. It's non fungible. <laughs> like here's an example. Here's an example. Um, I work with a publisher. What does that mean? No, let's let's go back to the other no, episode. That's a joke. <laughs> um, no, quick example. Uh, I work with a publisher for my books, and <clears throat> um, of course, the publisher has. I've given the publisher. Uh, we have a contract, and in that contract, uh, the publisher is allowed to give others the right to use it. For example, the publisher uh, decides to mm. sell a manuscript to to a publisher in China, which has happened, and the Chinese then translate it and publish it. That is covered under that contract. So uh, there's no discussion there. It's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. But if now the publisher gets sold to another company, so if the publisher changes ownership, then I will I can get my usage rights back. So there's, oh, okay. it's, it's, it's a really in interesting thing that I only partially understand. <clears throat> I should probably understand it better. But um, the thing is, the ownership right is is yours, and it's always going to be yours. And yeah, we also don't have fa what we happens? also don't have fair use here in Germany. Doesn't exist. No. No. Oh. And what, can you pass it on? Like when you die, can you pass the copyright on to somebody? Like well, it doesn't have copyright. Like your family. There's no like copyright. Like we don't have copyright. <laughs> But your your creator is right. You can't pass no. that on. It just dies when you die, and that's it. I think there are some constructs under which you can oh. you can pass on the licensing rights, and there's old okay. uh, German literature that is still being protected by the by the family, the heirs of of the author after okay. their death. For some, there's some constructs that 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 works under, but in general, um, you cannot. Licensing can be passed on in some way, but the ownership right is yours, and you're the owner. So I could do a, a comic book version of Budenbrooks, and nobody would come after me. Probably <laughs> nothing would happen to you. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, so the, that's. I mean, this, I'm this often is, to start doing that. This, it's interesting. <laughs> it's interesting that the whole sort of you know the afterlife aspect of it because it's one thing that the the UK law is is explicit about, um, and uh, it, it says it says here, um, but the you know the copyright in an image typically lasts seventy years past the death mm. of the creator. It's the same here. So. It, but that that's not 70 years for the image that's 70 years from the from the passing of the mm. creator so you could have a photograph taken let's say a creator was born in 1880 yeah let's start with that so so we're born in born in 1880 took a photograph you know uh in i know 1898 at the age of 18 and then lived till 1960 and died at, at the ripe old age of 80 mm. years that that image taken at this point over 120 years ago would still be in its original copyright. <laughs> well, is patent law similar in in England and Germany? Is um, there a difference? I couldn't. I couldn't tell you. I can tell. And by, and by the way, the the o the originator's yeah. right does also live on for 70 years here in mm. Germany. Mm. I've just looked this up, but what that exactly means, okay. I don't know. It's just something that. Uh, that never really came up in this context. But, um, yeah, it is 70 years. I just learned that. Where it becomes very tricky is in the realm of artistic expression. Those have been very public um, court cases here mm -hmm. with artists who use appropriated art, um, wherein they would take art, comment on it, satirize it, or even make small changes. Um those changes are by law if they do not affect the commercial use by the original copyright owner 
and they are transformative, underline that, which feels very subjective to a judge or jury. That's why this is very amorphous. It has to mm. prove its transformative nature and the fact that it has a social commentary wrapped around it. So it takes an image and transforms it by its context and usage that gives who created that appropriated art the right uh, of a new copyright. Mm -hmm. um, where it becomes very <clears throat> difficult is, and, and these court cases have been there, um, for the most part, if they are uh, intensely trans, Jeff Koons would be a great example. Uh, Richard Prince would be another example. These are, you can Google these court cases, but mm. they're often found uh, in different ways where a jury just said, no, that's transformative, that's not transformative. And then the penalties are significant. You can you can actually buy IP insurance to insure yourself, but that's also expensive. So uh, mm. appropriated Art, especially in the international world, which is now where we find ourselves publishing globally, um, whereas an American court may find that you have uh, infringed, a, a German court might say, no, it's fair use. Um, Chinese, they pay little attention to it anyway. Uh, I found when I was in China, I found all my movies. I could just walk into any mm. video store and all of them were there on, on DVDs. Uh, reprinted, republished um, as part of an underground economy. You know, I, w I wasn't receiving any any residuals from that. Uh, and the film business is very, you know, part of my my um, um, kind of involvement in the, the Directors Guild of America here is is uh, ascertaining how international copyright works on, say, for a filmmaker. I make a film. Warner Brothers pays for it. If I was in France, I would have ownership, at least partial ownership of that film. In America, I own nothing. Um, so that if it's pirated in, I get residuals, but that's based on a negotiation of my guild, not because there's <laughs> trois morale. Mm -mm. Uh, but in China, you know, they, they're arguing, oh my God, you know, the Chinese are, are stealing our, <laughs> our movies. And of course, my attitude is, but you're stealing mine as well. In, in other words, all of this is very amorphous. And also in China, they could solve that just by making it, by taking those street dealers and legitimizing them and making sure instead of paying $5 for a DVD, they're paying six and $1 goes. That's their business but, model but out is, the window, right? <laughs> that's right. So, <laughs> you know, uh, the actual ownership of something in the artistic ephemeral world of image creation yeah. is a very difficult uh, thing to get your hands around. Um, it's almost trial and error uh, in, my, in, in, in my world. Um, but uh, it's always good to consult with some experts before you take a jump because the cost of, of court cases, even in success, could be significant. So mm. you don't want to go there. So, uh, the, and, and the whole thing has to be weighed against other rights. I mean, uh, in Germany, the, the, the freedom of art is very high up on the, on the ladder of uh, legal freedoms. I think it's, let me see, Article 5 of the German Constitution guarantees the right? freedom of art so that that's what satire falls under for example yeah um so there mm -hmm. so so you always have the, the way these different kind of things and it mm. yeah it's not easy um Imar, question to you um in the pre-show you said something yes. about ireland and copyright that uh i stopped you saying because yeah. i i said let's <laughs> let's talk about this on on the episode so um, our uh, copyright laws are fairly similar to the UK and come under the European ones as well. So like it kind of everything you've said kind of holds true. But um, in my little bit of research, I discovered and I didn't know this, that the very first ever a case of, well, not case, but um, example of copyright infringement happened here in the sixth century. What? When uh, Column Kill. Yeah. St. Column Kill was a scribe 
in a monastery. Um, St. Finian was another scribe in another monastery, both very well respected as people and at the time. And um, uh, St. Finian, or it wasn't a saint at the time, he was just Finian, wasn't he? <laughs> um, had this copy of a, a, a book of Psalms that he had transcribed, scribed by hand. And apparently Colm Kill borrowed the the document and transcribed it in one night, um, which caused a bit of a furore. And it ended up going uh, in front of like a Brehan Law judge. And now the Brehan Law was something that was followed in Ireland before all the conquests when the clans and everything were in charge and the chieftains. So... Um, under those laws, like there was no kind of um, enforcement. Um, the judge would uh, make his decision, but it was a strong recommendation that he was making rather than being able to do anything about it. It was like the public would sort of decide then. So um, he decided that um, it was Finian's, uh, the original document, and that um, the, with the way it was described was um, every cow has its calf, and every book has its copy. So under Brehan law, um, that ancient law, um, it, it meant that um, Finian was, you know, the original creator. But um, Colm Kill didn't accept that. So they had a big war, ended up starting a war, uh, <laughs> after which he fled and, and started his monastery in Iona. So that's how that happened. Wow. And they ended up making him a saint then. Yeah, Iona. I know. Except the Isle of Skye. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it is, isn't it? Yeah, mm. or is it just its own island, Iona? Iona, yeah, that is crazy. Yeah, yeah I guess I was going to ask you: Did anyone lose their head? Obviously, a lot of people. Did. <laughs> Lots of people <laughs> lost their heads. Uh, yeah. Apparently, a bloody battle, the name of which I can't remember. Um, and the other thing I found, <clears throat> which is interesting, was um, Jeremiah. The way you're talking about the kind of derivative art, um, I put a link to it in there, and it's. Um, that iconic image of Che Guevara that um, Jim Fitzpatrick, the mm. illustrator, made mm. back in the 60s. Yeah. So um, he gave that away, essentially, after he made it um, as kind of a tribute to the man because he was such a fan. And um, it's been used, like, <clears throat> used and abused um, all over the place for years and years and years. So uh, at one point he decided that um, he was kind of tired of that. So in, I think it was 2011 he decided that he was going to try and take back the copyright. And um, he did eventually um, manage to do that and gave it to um, Che Guevara's family. Mm. Wow. Um, who now have it. Yeah, now he kept the rights to make his limited edition prints of it, which he still does on his website. Um, but yeah, the, the, the rights he gave back to the family. Which One of the problems uh, cool. for those who have copyright and patents also is uh, suing for enforcement. Mm. Uh, that That's a, a very, very difficult thing. I mean, you know, um, I... And I think, actually, no sorry, problem. interestingly as well, that image, the screen print, was uh, inspired by a yeah. photograph uh, by another guy whose name I've forgotten. And he um, had a bit of, of um, a problem with Jim Fitzpatrick. I think he tried to um, sue Jim Fitzpatrick for copyright. That's right. But obviously, like the way that. you've defined it, it was derivative. It was a whole new thing. So it deserved its own its own status, sure. like as a, as a work. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, a, a lot of kind of Banksy, work you know the, mm. the 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 way art works is is just uh, it, music as well the fusion of influences to create new works mm. uh is something that's extraordinary i think w when the works themselves start to move into the uh world of commercialism of other people making profits over or on mm. the backs of other people's work that's when it gets very mm. uh, problematic um i think if you appropriate work and hang it in a gallery <clears throat> essentially for a one-on-one -on -one experience you won't run into any uh legal issues um you know there's a very famous case uh, i forget who the filmmaker was made a film on barbie 
like used Barbie in unconventional ways mm. to create a film of social. <laughs> and and uh, Mattel sued. And it was a very, very um, intense case. And um, evidently, uh, I, I forget the outcome, but the arguments were that Barbie was a cultural icon and uh, the work was social commentary. And the work in no way um, took away Mattel's right to exploit, nor their particular, um, they, they didn't infringe on their profits in any way. Um, and that's really where the arguments were. I mean, if somebody mm. takes a picture of a Barbie and makes a poster size and paints it and hangs it in a museum, they're, they're not going to be sued by Mattel. I mean, we we see this with Cause, you know, K A W S, his work, which kind of references Mickey Mouse sometimes, and you know, you you have all of that, but but there, you know, I don't. Maybe Disney has tried, but but I don't think they've been successful. So I guess we are not going to solve the question of who owns your work um, <laughs> Just fully in this episode. And by the way, none of what we said here is legal advice just to be on the same side. <laughs> <laughs> Very good point. That, that's right. It, it, does, seem sad, Im- so it, just, it does seem important to actually put the, the, the copyright mark on your work, though. Like, I, I, it's not something I do, but it seems that, um, like, there's no way to register copyright here, and it seems there's not really anywhere to register copyright anywhere, is there? Oh, yeah, here so, there is. Um, there's a copyright on you're, it. Is there? Yeah, there's not not yeah. here. The copyright um, so sign won't do anything for you in Germany. In it's not Germany. mean doesn't mean anything. No, um, you, you know, all it is is a record that you have registered your work in some uh, realm yeah, somewhere, yeah. which you can't do in Germany. Yeah. <laughs> no. Anyway, I don't think you could do it in China either. <laughs> Probably not. Let's yeah. let's move on to the picks of the week. Um, let me see. Who wants to go first? Adrian, how about you? Uh, yeah, very happy to go first. Um, my, um, my my pick of the week has got nothing to do with photography this week. Um, and in fact, it <laughs> is just to do uh, with a book that I'm reading. Um, a book I only became aware of. It was either yesterday or earlier today. Um, and it's a it's a book called There Is No Anti Memetics Division, and it's by an author called Quantum. That's spelt without any vowels um, in in the modern web sense. Um, it's a really interesting concept. Uh, it's a concept of of uh, what do you do about anti memes? Yeah, ideas that seek to hide themselves from you. Um, and and what if the and it happens to be a sci-fi novel and is talking about uh, you know a, a threat of the earth being attacked as well so so there's a the, the plot is, is how, how do you fight a war about something that if you even think about it um it, 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 you'll get killed and and, and actually more <laughs> more likely you're going to forget about it because it's an idea that wants to keep <laughs> itself secret just a really uh, to me a, a really fresh idea if i really stretched i could I could link it to to uh, ideas that and, and ownership of creative stuff that we've been talking about today, but I think that probably pulls it a little bit far. <laughs> well, let let the listener make that connection instead of you making it. Maybe maybe they find that link there. Um, Good point. <laughs> my pick of the week is um, directly connected to what we talked about today. Um, or indirectly, it is an episode of 99% Invisible, which is one of my favorite podcasts. And uh, they had a very recent episode about the real book. If uh, you've ever played jazz, then you know what the real book is, which is um, this collection of jazz standards, tunes that um, kind of every jazz musician kind of has to know. And that is comes from the so-called fake books um, and it ended up uh, be- well it, it was created as an illegal non-copyrighted collection of um, tunes that all session mu- all session musicians who had one of those could uh, could simply hop in a session open their real book page 25 and play the tune so it was one of these um, it was an important tool but it it took until 2003 until it was finally legalized. So, wow. um, very interesting story. I have one of those because I used to be in jazz sessions. Um, so for me, that was especially interesting to hear the 
history of this. And they even tracked down one of the originators who was very, very private about it. So, I I love that episode. I listened to it. Oh, yeah. It was great. For, and for me, it had this direct relation to the things. I, I could just grab grab that book from a drawer and go and stroke it and go, it's my real book. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I connect a lot of uh, nice memories with that. So next up is hmm, Imar, how about you? Yeah, um, my I have two picks in there now because um, uh, this week I made a virtual tour of the um, exhibition that we currently have on. I mentioned last week or the week before um, about this. It's called Project Clean Sweep. Um, I'd just like you all to have a look at it. And with, I'd love to you to... Um, can you, it's got a VR, you can put your VR helmet on. I don't, I don't have a way to do that, so I can't test it properly, but I can do it send on my device. The, send me the link, I'll have, a, I'll have a test, of course. It's, it's, in, it's in the workflow right there. Um, I put it under my pick of the week. So. Um, oh, down there, yeah. Uh, I will, I will one, test it offline. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Um, the other one was um, this newspaper club, which I, I found. That. And Is that, is that we the were, place you work at? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's out of my little home. This is it very nicely good, done. Think. Very nice. Mm. Yeah, it's great. There's some audio and stuff in there that you can... I had some fun making this. I had to literally hide underneath the tripod so that <laughs> so that I wouldn't be caught in the... And actually, in the front, on the entrance, when you can see the top of my bobble hat, <laughs> if you look really closely. <laughs> but, um, Let me yeah, see. It's fun. Where's your head? It's very, my bob oh i've covered it up with the i've covered actually you put the logo on top of it <laughs> good job i put the um compass compass thing on top of it there just today um yeah the other thing i had was um as we were talking about zines in the past and things thought you were all like this um newspaperclub.com um it's um they've got lovely selection of they make newspapers so you make your own newspapers and Look like editions of, I think 20 is, uh, I think you could make one if you want, but obviously it'd be quite expensive. But um, So so you can print uh, your own newspaper? Very, very nice. You can print your nice. own newspapers, yeah. And you can make a broadsheet or you can make, I like the little mini sort of zine. I thought it might make a nice, um, you could do like a limited edition or something. Um, Look lovely. at that. Fabulous. So, mm, really good. Aren't they nice? Ah, uh, mm. they are. Mm, an Irish company. That's a great idea. An Irish company, and they—they they obviously know I'm in Germany because they say including delivery to Germany. There we go. Ah, oh, fantastic! <laughs> well, there goes your privacy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, last but not least, um, Jeremiah. Completely off topic. Uh, it was just some of the most extraordinary images I saw last week, and I just wanted to share. These are glamour shots of. Deep, deep, deep sea wow. fish. Oh, oh he got that. the one with the lantern on his head. These are really extraordinary wow. images. I am, I was blown away and continue to be so. Look at this. That's, there there oh, must be great. some UV light wow. involved. Wow. Who mm. knows? But, uh, you know, talk about fabulous looking creatures. <laughs> That is beautiful. Oh, a larval yeah. spotted wow. ribbon fish off the coast of Palm Beach. So for, for those uh, listening, this is in the science division of the uh, New York Times last yep. week. And the show notes will be there. I encourage everybody to take a look at images that you've never seen before. And of course, all the other links that we had in the show, all the other things we talked about in the show are going to be in the show notes as well. So... I guess, I guess that so brings us again. to the end of this episode. That's it. Uh, of course, everyone, check us out on thefuturephotography.com, on our different uh, social media presences, TFOP Now, on Twitter, on Insta, and so on. And, and Discord. And dis oh, d of course, not to forget Discord, which <laughs> is our interactive platform. So you can talk to us, you can exchange stuff with us. Um, this was interesting, even though not not super, not very conclusive, because copyright is a very <laughs> a very 
dramatic. It's very, it's meta. It's meta. Let's we, talk about anyway, photography next week. With that, <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> <laughs>